Hello, everybody. Welcome Hello. to our webinar on our third webinar on sexual harassment, gender based violence and discrimination, research, action and narrativization. Um, as Sue Gender, we've been uh, doing these webinars for roughly a month and a half now, and uh, we're very excited that they'll be going on. So every Wednesday, every other Wednesday at 6 p.m. Istanbul time, we'll be here with new speakers. Uh, the idea came up of uh, our mutual concern on these topics and our uh, basic sort of uh, questioning of what might be going on during the pandemic. Um, new challenges, uh, new issues that might need to be brought up and new uh, ways of uh, struggling. Um, and we thought that it could be wonderful to basically um, uh, uh, nurture international collaboration and uh, to work together and to raise new questions and to maybe even discuss the new challenges that we are uh, confronting at this time. Hence, uh, we decided that uh, we would bring in um, scholars from various institutions. We started with, of course, our partner, Margarita von Brentano Centrum from Germany, and Heike Pantelmann uh, basically uh, provided an amazing uh, wide spectrum at, of what was going on in uh, German institutions and at the Free University of Berlin in particular. She uh, focused, of course, on uh, how um, there were taboos around the university as an enlightened institution and how it was very difficult to get past uh, these uh, taboos. Our second, um, our second uh, presenter was Elizabeth Armstrong from University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And she uh, uh, presented the American uh, political history of the last, I would say three, four decades, um, the history of Title IX, the uh, connection between anti-discrimination policies and sexual harassment. She also talked to us about um, theories on institutional uh, sort of frameworks uh, from uh, various sources. Uh, one was one very useful source was Jennifer Freyd, institutional betrayal, institutional courage. All of these terms were extremely useful in trying to, of course, um, criticize and um, take a look at, analyze our own institutions. And she provided a number of references which might be uh, great for us for all of all those who are actually doing research on these topics those resources will prove uh, very useful. Now, these webinars are being recorded. Um, you are going to be able to ask questions. You might want to write down the questions in the chat section, but we might also have some time to actually go into a discussion at the very end. A second issue that I want to raise is that uh, we will have simultaneous interpretation. Please take a look at the uh, interpretation uh, button. Uh, this is going to be the second from the right, if you look below on Zoom. And uh, if you want to continue in English, choose English. If you would like a Turkish translation, uh, please choose Korean. <laughs> so there's no, there's no Turkish version in uh, Zoom, so you need to choose Korean to be able to follow the Turkish uh, translation of all of this. Before I start uh, with uh, Rela and the wonderful webinar and the presentation today, I want to thank uh, the Sujander team, particularly Begum and Guru Gyokar for the amazing amount of effort they put into, these, into the organization and conceptualization of the webinars. I also want to thank our simultaneous interpreters. We have uh, one new interpreter today. Uh, Sungur Savran is not with us today, so I'd like to thank Ushil Demirakan and Jaylan Gurman for being with us. And we know how difficult it is to translate such um, eloquent, elaborately formulated, sophisticated material. And today is going to be particularly difficult because Rela is going to be uh, working on fiction and uh, texts with us. So that's going to be particularly challenging to uh, translate into Turkish. So without further ado, I want to introduce Rela Mazali, a wonderful friend and colleague. She's a writer, independent scholar, and feminist anti-militarist from Israel. She writes hybrid genre literary research in both her mother tongues, which she considers to be Hebrew and English. Active since 1980 in opposing Israel's militarization and military occupation, she co-founded the New Profile Movement to demilitarize society and state. This was happening already in 1998. 
uh, and this is what she says in her biography. And later, the small um, arms disarmament and gun control project, uh, which is called Gun Free Kitchen Tables, GFKT, which she coordinates. A mother of three and a grandmother of six, she lives just north of Tel Aviv with her partner. Some recent publications uh, by Rella Mazali include Hospital Archive in Bad Mothers, Regulations, Representations, and Resistance. Another work um, by her that's relevant to today's topic is called Complicit Dissent, Dissenting Complicity, A Story and Its Context in Apartheid in Palestine, Hard Laws and Harder Experiences. And the last work that I want to mention has the title, Speaking of Guns, Launching Gun Control Discourse and Disarming Security Guards in a Militarized Society. And this was published in the International, International Feminist Journal of Politics. Now I want to, uh, before Rella starts, mention that we want to, to, to bring scholars, uh, policymakers, uh, NGO activists, writers, filmmakers, theater practitioners together to reflect on these issues and to also reflect on the challenges of writing, whether in scholarly work or in uh, fiction. And uh, today, uh, Rela takes on that very challenging task, and her title is Writing Gender-Based Violence into Essay Tales. So she'll be talking about fictionalizing um, accounts of um, rape, uh, silenced, and very difficult to find, in fact, information about, data about, um, rape of Palestinian women by Israeli uh, occupied occupying forces. And she's going to reflect on questions of entitlement and limited knowledge. So we really look forward to this uh, fascinating uh, topic, Rela, and uh, to hearing about um, all the issues uh, regarding narrativization that you're going to talk about. We're so glad you could join us. Welcome. Thank you. It's very moving to me to be uh, part of this webinar and uh, and to be, at least in this sense, with some very dear friends uh, from Istanbul, I wish I could be there with you. And thank you for all of you for inviting me and for having this session. Uh, we, we have become very accustomed to translating gender-based violence into text. I think that many of us take the value of this practice for granted it's not often that we unpack or question it. Our sense of its value stems at least in part from our convictions that one, despite serious divides and diversities, we share aspects of a global gendered experience. Two, this experience is framed and generated by a global power system, which some of us still insist on calling patriarchy. Three, this power system, as it is theorized by feminists, is one which controls and oppresses women per se, as well as additional othered genders, that is, genders that have been positioned and treated as others. It's the universality that we ascribe to these structures and to parts of our experience within them that allows our texts to compare incidents, for instance, or discern patterns and recurring performances, or to identify and name these, as we've named sexual harassment or stalking or date rape. This body of documented feeling, thinking, physically sensing and research, which we spin out of threads of violence, builds up a crucial, not crucial knowledge base, cumulatively, usually slowly. This knowledge constitutes a key resource for formulating new laws and campaigning for them, for example, and for monitoring the enforcement of these once they are enacted, and for shifting and changing cultural norms, regardless of law and courts. Sharing in text, not only, but also in text, is one of the main tools we use for world changing. 
you know this, it's more or less what you're doing here in this webinar in the first place. Beyond charting and understanding and resisting and reversing to some extent power systems, there are also multiple personal motives for sharing experiences of gender-based violence. And some of them include speaking out or writing out as the case is today that I will be talking about today in order to reclaim some of the agency and power robbed at least temporarily by acts of violence that are perpetrated upon me. Or uttering experience in order to counteract the loneliness and isolation to which the violence subjects me as a refusal to be confined and defined by the violence or politicizing my experience of violence by connecting to others and their experiences towards organizing against this violence. All of this presumes and concerns my own victimization, which I'm speaking out, or in this case, writing out, in order to help myself feel seen and heard and validated, and which I'm transforming or trying to into a resource to both draw on and to offer, offer to others. Now I want to trouble this outline. Much of our knowledge of such violence, in fact, so much of it, is not only firsthand, but also secondhand. It is knowledge experienced on and through the bodies and psyches and souls of others. It is experienced vicariously through their accounts. So I'll just begin by asking when we acquire such knowledge from other women or about other women, who owns it? Is it mine to mold into text? More specifically, is it mine to mold into a text that will help its author, me, feel seen and heard and validated? Even if I honestly mean for her or them, these other women, to be seen and heard and validated too. I write literary texts. They're not exactly fiction. I write literary texts that I describe as essay tales. They are both essay and tale. They research, record, and reflect on facts that are facts and yet are story told. They meticulously document reality, my personal reality. They use my experiences as easily accessible research materials and detailed field notes whose underlying structures they try to critically unpick and unpack. But writing about my life experience, I also unavoidably write about others' life experiences not about interviewees or informants, about people and particularly women who were simply or not so simply parts of my life. Some of the essay tales I write are based on interviews. In the course of these, I receive the standard kind of formal permission and cooperation. But in other cases, there were no interviews and no permission. Some of the women I wrote about, for instance, worked at my house regularly, cleaning it every other week or every other, or every week for long periods. And we talked extensively. At the time I employed and knew and spoke with them, I didn't know I was going to write about them. It was only long after the facts that I realized that I wanted to, or I should, or I could write out some of their experiences and write out my respective responses. I viewed and still do view this both as a means to narrating their highly significant and largely untold experiences and a means to interrogating my reactions and replies to their realities as an experience of relative privilege. 
voicing the experiences of women and others who are never heard through the filter of social political marginalization is a standard feminist trope and practice. I'm not devaluing or belittling this practice, but my writing attempts something that is more multi-layered. It critically scrutinizes a position of relative privilege. It sets out to understand the components of that social positioning, to locate its blind spots, to begin to account for these. It is not a process of confession and absolution. It offers a precise, detailed description. This is what it is, it says. Take a close look. This is how devious and stubborn it is. This is how it works privilege. Privilege, however, is only and always relative. It can only be explored in relation. Accordingly, I have mostly learned about my privilege from women who are positioned very differently than I am by the society and country I live in. The country I live in, Israel, and its society are structurally and extremely racist. Manifestations of its racism are everywhere, stripping some groups of almost all basic rights while granting other groups partial, limited, and very precarious rights. Within Israel's system of stratification, I'm classified as part of the hegemony. Of course, I am a woman, meaning that I am always a lesser hegemon. But other classifications position me as a Jewish woman of westernized descent, living or performing an educated middle-class heterosexual life. Whether or not I identify with all these labels is beside the point, I don't. But I am perceived through them. And to a large extent, they determine the access I enjoy to a range of common resources. The women who taught me the most about my privilege were not from the hegemonic group, along with the gender-based violence to which almost each of them was subjected. They were all facing other kinds of intersecting discrimination, brutality, and oppression. My teachers included women migrating in search of livelihood, often without status or papers, as they're called members of minority religious groups, particularly the black Hebrews in Israel, and they included Palestinian women. Regardless of its critically unpacking the elements of my privilege, my writing about these women's lives is rendered problematic by our differential sharply stratified positioning. For one thing, the many different resources that enable me to write are largely inaccessible to them. I am able to write about their lives due to the preferential access I have to these resources. In that sense, it's relevant to ask whether my writing their experiences is another form of exploitation, as subtle as it may be. One of my essay tales retells an account of the rape of a Palestinian woman whose name I will never know. At some point during the 1980s, Israeli income tax officials stationed in the occupied West Bank forced her to provide sexual services. I know this because I heard about it from my life partner while he was serving a tour of reserve duty in the West Bank before the first Palestinian uprising, the Intifada. He had unsuspectingly witnessed the event as it took place in a concealed part of the office he was working in. In hindsight, in the hindsight immediately after it happened, he had worked out the details he related to me. I didn't know at the time what I only realized many years later that Testimonies such as his, as indirect as it was, were extremely rare. They still are. Counter to widely held Israeli beliefs, though, 
I do not take this to be evidence that such events are extremely rare. Susan Slomovich says in her discussion of rape during the Palestinian Nakba of 1948, for historians, the argument from silence proposes that silence is also inform informative. If no confirmation exists in archival sources that something did or did not happen, such silences merely inform about a lack in the documentation and not that the information does not exist. That granted, however, what should I make as a writer of this persistent silence? Coming accidentally upon a concrete, very rare testimony to rape without names or any identifying details, should I heed the silence and adhere to it? Or should I practice the widely embraced and valued feminist principle of speaking out, sounding silenced life experiences. Palestinian feminist scholar Nadira Shalhub Kevorkian has deliberated about this. It is notable that writing in 2010, she is discussing current, current to 2010, and not only past events. She writes, the price of disclosing the invisible experiences for Palestinian women, who would pay the price of such visibility? And might visibility add insult to injury and inflict additional trauma and loss? I would like to argue, she says, that in some cases, women themselves exercise the right to remain silent and choose to live in the darkness in an effort to negotiate their survival strategies. Their refusal to speak up should not only be taken into consideration, but also respected and protected. For as I have stated elsewhere in my research on women facing sexual abuse in Palestine, women are not vehicles for political activism, research, or change. Our first and most important ethical and political commitment as feminists should be to be guided by women's judgments, silences, speeches, and choices. To me, being a feminist means not only bringing or not bringing the power and meanings inherent in silence and speech, it also means being responsive and responsible for the ways of engaging, writing, reading and not writing or visibilizing the hidden voices of those who are surviving in the dark and dealing with injustice on a daily basis. For my part, and my part is now me, not Shalhub uh, Kevorkian, in thinking about this essay tale, I would add the question, who am I, a woman of Israel's Jewish settler state hegemony, to expose information on a subject about which Palestinians as a collective have largely imposed silence. Isabel Humphreys and Lale Khalili have noticed regarding 1948 though, despite the use of rape as an instrument of expulsion, Direct descriptions of the circumstances of rape have never been incorporated into narratives of Nakba atrocities. Narratives of rape and fear of it are associated with the guilt of losing the land, encouraging the silencing of memories of atrocities against women. However, they do observe in an important and devastating element of women's experience, an important and devastating element of women's experiences and memories of the Nakba, its concrete details and personal horrors are pushed to the background by both relations of gender and discourses of nationalism. Fatma Qasim, another leading Palestinian scholar, takes this a step further in her discussion of the Nakba. She says, by hiding incidents of rape and silencing these stories, and silencing these stories, sorry, Palestinian women are complicit 
with their self perception with the self perception of men as warriors in quotation marks devaluing their own contribution to society and thereby reproducing the subjugation of women by men this marked silence on the topic of rape is in complete contrast to the way these women describe their role as active agents in rebuilding taking care of and protecting themselves and the family at the peak of crisis and war. Shalhub Kevorkian, reviewing her own conclusions, also finally keeps the question open. She says, women may need to remain invisible and their decision to deny their knowledge of voice and prevent their narratives from seeing the light of day should guide our constructions. But one must not forget that it is in the mere intimate level of specific cases of an invisible life suffering that one could develop a feminist methodology that researches invisibility and comprehends in depth the effect of the power on women's lives. I'll add to this important ongoing discussion that there is another player in the equation. There is also the rapist. And indeed, Sriomovic asks, what is rape when it is not documented? Or when it is incompletely documented in so far as the Palestinian rape victim Enters, enters a system of academic research to be transformed into a collective category behind which Israeli soldiers are guaranteed anonymity. Qasim points out that Palestinian silence on the reality of rape was, and still is, suited to the attitude of the Zionist Jewish authorities who silenced the cases of rape in order to demonstrate moral superiority. As part of the hegemony of the Zionist state, the state and the military and the occupying mechanisms, all of which still claim moral superiority, I am implicated in the practice of silencing women's experiences of rape by occupying forces. Within this context, as part of this collective, my incidental knowledge of a case of rape can and should, as Shalhub Kevorkian puts it, disturb the production of hegemonic knowledge, even long years after the facts, or interfere with what Slomovich calls the violation of history. In writing out my limited third hand, but nevertheless, rare knowledge of this case, I was writing out one refutation of this wild, widely head, held Israeli belief that such events are extremely rare. So I'll read a few excerpts from my essay tale, Income Tax Ramallah. The original was a book chapter in Hebrew, a Turkish translation by Tan Somnez and Farhi Denser was published in the Feminist Journal, uh, which I abbreviate as Feministia Klasimlar, but I guess you know what I mean. An English version was published just last year by Inverse Journal. This is the cover they used. The passages I'm reading are the report, are a re reconstruction of the report as I heard it from my partner and parts of my response. The top guy went in, behind the curtain I mean, but I still wasn't really looking or paying attention or getting it. I only got it when he came out again. And he was still buttoning up the top button of his pants without even bothering, let's say, to make sure that I wouldn't see, even though he already knew that I didn't like the things they were doing to the people there and that I'd stamped all the applications. It was as if what he'd done in there was 
totally not a problem for sure not between guys soldiers reservists you know horny guys as if it was all just so natural totally normal and then the clerk went in and a little while later not too long after he came out but first before that before the first guy the one in charge came out even from my little workspace off to the side in the passageway with all the noise coming from outside from all the people waiting in line all the kids and all that i picked up on looking back right after it i realized that at some point i'd heard groaning just his and after the clerk came out straightening his shirt and his pants and going straight to the bathroom a few minutes later she came out too totally covered you couldn't see any of her face completely covered she went out and i got up and i walked a little ways out of the front door and i saw the guy the scared one who had brought her waiting off at one side at the edge of the alleyway and she walked up to him and they left when I went back inside, the curtain was open. Since most of the taxpayers in the territories do not keep books, both income tax and EAT are assessed for them by best judgment. It says on page 20 of the February 1990 Betselem report titled, The System of Taxation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, as an instrument for the enforcement of authority during the uprising. This process is based on negotiations between the taxpayer and the tax officer, leaving the assessment in the hands of the officer. Since it is impossible to establish the facts, the assessment has become a matter of bargaining between the taxpayer and the authorities. The impression is that the authorities have used this, used this bargaining procedure very effectively as an instrument of their authority to put pressure on taxpayers for purposes unrelated to tax collection. I remember tears being shed continuously, almost all the while that Shaul was making and speaking his sentences. At some point pretty early on, they started forming and spilling. It wasn't exactly crying. I wasn't emitting any of the rasp or squeaks usually produced by my crying. I was silent. I didn't even utter a mumble or a sigh or a syllable. I couldn't mouth or let out a sound. The water was welling up and spilling straight out of a suffocating pain in my diaphragm, right under the ribs and at the center of the stomach that emptied me of voice. Straight out of severe humiliation, straight out of a vast rage that I had nowhere to put to take. Stunned at the hate rape, the forced fuck of this man in charge, the income tax clerk, the violation, the control, the filthy degradation, scornful, calculated violence, crushing laugh. My words, my English translated from my Hebrew, imagining her Arabic or her silence. I couldn't conjecture, feel, know just what she went through, what she thought, felt, said to herself. Scornful, crushing laugh. Voiceless, because Shaul only heard a man's groans. At them, at herself, I had no idea who she was, who he was, how, why. It makes a difference. The details make a difference. They're important. The colors of the print on the curtain, every woman is a different story always. Every woman is positioned 
fashioned differently inside the framework of repressive forces. Different or partly overlapping forces at different intersections, but the tear path down each cheek spilled out of my intimate acquaintance with woman hatred of me, with a movement that once many years before had caught my head in a clamp and forced my face, my look away sideways under the hard hand pressed to my cheek at his moment of come. These excerpts offer a fair idea of how I wrote out this case of rape, but the essay tale isn't about this case in itself out of context. It is an attempt to draw up a detailed account of the role that I play, that my positioning plays in such tales of violence and oppression, in this tale of violence and oppression both as a recipient of these violence and oppression, though in forms that are or seem more moderate, and as a complicit member of the state and society perpetrating them brutally upon othered women. In this case, upon a colonized, militarily occupied woman. The essay tale takes a close look at multiple, sometimes minute expressions of both my privilege and its relativity. Among other things, it tries to account for the fact that I wrote out the tale over 20 years after I first heard my partner's account. And I'll conclude with a reflection on this fact. As I knew very well all along, I wasn't reading and remembering enough of the papers or enough of all those cumbersome, heavily worded B'Tselem reports whose typeset was always so small and illegible and crowded, or enough of the details. I knew I didn't know enough. And I knew I kept forgetting a lot of what I did read and know momentarily. Cases like this must have figured before in the reports and the papers. It couldn't be news to people who cared and who made it their business to know what was going on. No way. It simply didn't stand to reason that I, that Shaul, that we, that he and I knew something that other people didn't. That we'd actually happen directly, concretely onto the hard facts. Well, almost hard. And the dates and figures of something that others hadn't ever encountered directly. Without realizing or understanding what I was doing, I had firmly presupposed this no way. No way I know something and they don't. A habit, a very old one, a very stubborn one. They know more than me. They always know more than me. My shock at one more dark recess of filthy, violent corruption looked to me like my own, strictly my own. A direct result of my undone or partly done homework, of my failure to know enough. If I had read, remembered papers, reports, facts, details, I would have heard, known this long ago. I still would have been shocked, I'm sure. By the force of an individual case of pants buttons, of a self-satisfied smile, of a nonchalant verging on public flaunt, shocked by the force of the dead certainty of the testimony and conclusions of the man I share my life with. But I wouldn't have been so completely stunned when I did understand this years after, stunned at crashing headlong into my habit, mistake, of thinking myself perennially little and out of the know, at hitting the surface of a solid presupposition that I both unsaw and adhered to equally, that is, that what I knew, know, wasn't, isn't all that important can't be. 
ever. And meeting the hard rock bottom line of my self-reproach for not building sufficient knowing to see that this was all that important. For failing to build the capacity back then to discern the outlines of what I identified explicitly over 10 years later in March 2005 at a lecture I gave at Salon Mazal, the outlines, that is, of the black hole in the documentation of Israel's occupation. How is it, I asked the small group of women that gathered there to learn together in 2005, that we have no testimonies at all, or at least almost no testimonies, about the rape of Palestinian women by those who enforce the occupation. How is it? Why? Where are they? We have no good reason to believe that such things don't happen there. On the contrary, we have very good, well-grounded reasons to believe they do, because we know that they happen here, inside Israel, within the Green Line, all the time. They happen to women from Israel and to tourists and to migrant women workers in the homes of employers, in the homes of friends, in their own homes, in the streets, on the beaches, in the city parks, in cars. They happen to old women and young women and teenagers and little girls. They happen to disabled women and to rich women and to mothers. They are sufficiently common to make it unequivocally clear that there are no particular breaks or checks in Israel, either moral or cultural, against rape and violent treatment of women. I don't, we don't have any reason to believe that the same logic doesn't apply, among others, to Palestinian women under military occupation, particularly in light of the fact that in many places in the world, occupation and control by force and military rule are implemented, among other means, through rape and sexualized violence. It happened in Bosnia and in Serbia not too long ago. It happened in Rwanda. And here for years now, the military and the Shabak have been torturing Palestinian women, just like they torture Palestinian men, subjecting them to physical and mental torture. For some years now, it's even been openly admitted to. So why assume that there's no rape in addition to that? That the occupying regime doesn't, among other things, allow and feed on sexualized violence too? Why imagine that there is none? What there's none of, at least at this point, are testimonies. The question is why and what that indicates. The question is why and what that indicates. So I'm, um, I'm very much looking forward to any responses <laughs> and the observations. Thank you, Ra. This was very moving and very thought provoking. Uh, we might have a few questions that Guru might want to uh, moderate for the time being. Yes, you can write your questions in the chat box. You can also write in Turkish. I will go to the Turkish channel and read them out loud. I might want I might want to add uh, until you're until this gets rolling that I this is only the second time uh, the the Hebrew original was uh, published in 2011. Uh, last year, I think it was, for the first time, I gave a reading of this piece of the 
essay tale in Hebrew to a Hebrew speaking audience for the first time. It was very difficult for me. <laughs> and uh, this is the second time that I've done it. Um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to do this reading and reflection on, uh, on this writing process and on the actual writing. Thank you so much, Rela. There is a question and a comment. Um, the question is, could you talk about the reactions to your work? And then there's also a comment thanking you uh, for a moving talk. Thank you. Um, I'm also moved really seriously to be here. It's not just a polite form of speech. Um, reactions to my work. It's interesting. Uh, my work, like my activism are, uh, and my research to a large extent, are uh, very marginalized in uh, Israeli society. I'm not, my name as an author is not familiar. I'm not a household name. Um, I am known in some circles, but it's not the kind of work that, uh, that is um, widely received, that is widely reviewed. Uh, it, is, uh, it meets the same kind of marginalization that I interpret to be resistance to a large extent uh, to, to letting it in to the mainstream uh, that I uh, encounter in, in activism. It's, um, it's made um, publicly unimportant by the fact that there are, that there is little reaction to it. And for me, publishing, for instance, is, is a very difficult issue. Um, I've published two books in Hebrew, one in English. Uh, each book is a whole, it's starting from zero. It's uh, so, um, and you know, publishing, like so many other things in our neoliberal reality, um, it rests on, uh, on uh, economic success. My, none of my writing is economically successful. Uh, so that compounds the question of uh, all, all of the issues that uh, confront me when I, when I deliberate about what I will write and why I'm writing it and for whom I'm writing it. Uh, however, having said all that, there is, uh, from feminists in particular, from left, radical left-wing feminists, there is um, a strong response uh, to some of my writing, uh, including this chapter of the book. Uh, I remember one woman telling me that it was she could barely read it because it was so painful and she felt it was so important. Um, so that's just one, uh, uh, one um, example. Uh, last year when I did read, or I don't remember if it was a year and a half ago, I did read for an audience. The audience was electrified and it was a pretty big one. And uh, it was in Jerusalem, which is interesting because Jerusalem is a very tough city. Uh, although I'm sure the audience was mostly uh, people with left-leaning and feminist uh, interests. So that's about what I can say <laughs> uh, about how it was received. Thank you. Do we have any other questions, comments? Yes, there is one. Um, Bella, how do scholars react to the way you narrate these issues? 
Well, sometimes I'm invited to uh, talk, to speak to university classes uh, from this intersectional, intersectional in another sense. You know, we, we use intersectional um, when we talk about women's classifications, uh, but I mean, uh, to this interdisciplinary standpoint where what I do and write is uh, very openly both documentation and research, um, auto uh, ethnology, if you if you like, and uh, narrative, and um, uh, it's not exactly fictionalization, but it's like uh, um, as I said at the beginning, storytelling of it. So some uh, academics always women, always feminists, are extremely appreciative of this, um, of this kind of recognition that knowledge building um, is in fact uh, much more complex and less co compartmentalized than our uh, institutions allow. And uh, they invite me into their classes uh, where I speak about this kind of writing and I read and we have uh, discussions. Um, and um, for a, you know, a specific circle, it's, it's valuable, but uh, otherwise it's um, again, marginalized, uh, goes unrecognized when I write things that look more strictly academic, sometimes it's easier uh, to find them uh, venues and to um, get them uh, recognized. But uh, this particular, particular kind of, um, of knowledge building, and that's what I see it as actually, uh, is very hard to, um, to find uh, space for, which maybe as an explanation of why I'm so appreciative of having this space to speak to all of you. Thank you, Rila. I, I will read a comment and a question. They come together uh, from Maria Pilar Milagros Garcia from Boazit University in Turkey. I'm, re I'm quoting now. I wanted to expand on my thank you note. I teach literature at Boazici and want to work with primary sources that actually problematize and narrativize gender-based violence in general and rape in particular. So I'll read your work, hoping to include some of your work in my class. I was fascinated by your open and candid self-criticism in terms of privilege and being complicit. So I guess I could also touch upon that in my own class. As you've already talked about reactions to your work, I guess my question is whether you have any suggestions as how I could approach your work in my class. It's a class on literature, Maria. I, I'm not, yeah. Um, well, I think it, I think it's interesting to to question what literature is and whether liter what we know. Uh, is to a large extent based on on stories. I mean, I'm not. I'm stating the obvious. You, I, I'm sure you all deal with this issue, and uh, we don't. Somehow, in in uh, in academia, that tends to be less legitimate, less recognized. So I think looking at the hybridity of knowledge bu building across storytelling and fact collecting and documenting and researching is, uh, is really important in, in approaching uh, literary studies and really groundbreaking, sadly, still today. Uh, that would be my suggestion. And uh, 
since we've all gotten so accustomed to zooming in, <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to, to talk to a class if you're interested or whatever, you know, it's not, I'm not pushing myself on it, but I do this in Israel. I do. I go to uh, academic classes. I speak about this kind of writing and knowledge building and I read. So usually voluntarily. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Rela. Could you refer to other works you are inspired by? Mm, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> I started writing the kind of literature that I write very much alone. There was something about, I, I don't know, about literary writing that and as opposed to uh, research that just didn't sit well with me. And I started doing this and as I said, using my, my life experience as the uh, very accessible uh, nuanced materials that I could look at without, you know, without uh, doing field work. And, um, and as I was doing this, uh, somewhere along the way, I did uh, encounter postmodernist writing, mostly by men back then, uh, which on the one hand made me happy to discover that there were people experimenting with forms of texts that, um, that were non-standard and that uh, uh, departed from the uh, conventional formats and forms. And on the other hand, I felt, well, but I made this up. What? <laughs> I'm not influenced by them. Um, I think that the, for me, the, the actually the most influential texts are, are uh, more um, philosophical, feminist, uh, feminist theory, uh, which I have crafted into a different genre of what I feel in some sense is feminist theory. Um, so that's, I guess, my answer. Um, you know, I can make it. I actually, my book in English, which is called Maps of Women's Goings and Stayings, which actually did come out in an academic uh, press uh, somehow. <laughs> I've made it through the cracks. Um, uh, has a lot of quotes from a lot of feminist texts in it. And it has a kind of a non-standard bibliography uh, referring to those uh, sources. Uh, so they're all there. I mean, that was, it came out in 2001. And, um, uh, you know, I've read since quite a bit, but it, it, what I did there was, that was a book that was partly based on interviews, interviews with, with women who, uh, who had, uh, traveled very extensively and very uh, courageously in a way, uh, kind of exceeding the standard boundaries of, uh, on, that usually um, exist on women's mobility and freedom of movement. And um, it is a, a combination of uh, fact and fiction in this case. There was one fictional character, uh, pretty clearly fictional, but still, are actually two fictional characters, um, and uh, and and a series of interviewed women, and the way I perceived it, all of these women were sources as well as the writers that I quoted. So I was using pieces of interviews and pieces of writing and pieces of imagining. And these were uh, wrapped up actually in something that I called 
a talking house, which was a house built of talking and made for talking, uh, where these women who never met in reality gathered and discussed different aspects of their mobility and experience. So some of the, uh, some of the sources that really moved me and inspired me are in there, in that book. <laughs> Thank you, Rela. I will now um, switch channels and read a question in Turkish and it will be translated to you. Çalışmalarınıza gelen tepkilerden de yola çıkarak şu konudan biraz daha bahsedebilir misiniz? Kendi yazılarınızdan okumalar yapmayı bir feminist aktivizm yöntemi olarak nasıl değerlendirirsiniz? Hmm. Wow, that's a good question. <gülüyor> uh, actually, I think it was at, at Sabanchi that I uh, spoke about this a few years back to some extent uh, about uh, writing when I write myself, when I write my life experience, um, I'm actually count in my view, I'm counteracting uh, a standard literary convention that uh, that dissociates between the author as a person, as a biological living person, and the narrator of the book. Uh, and I'm kind of writing against the grain of that because I feel that for me, writing is about expression direct expression and about actually putting myself out there in a sense i was writing i was talking earlier about speaking out and writing out but it's also about putting myself out there we all know that as activists as feminist activists part of the issue is putting our bodies out there or putting our voices out there in a risky situation because we're always going to be either uh, marginalized or uh, or uh, made fun of or laughed at or or hurt violent, violently not always almost always in some way or another okay so when I'm uh, reading I'm doing that doubly in the sense that here I am the writer who is writing herself and not uh, allowing that division to uh, easily uh, make things more comfortable and, uh, and dissociate what she is saying from her personal experience and passion and commitment. Uh, and I'm actually speaking it in my voice before a public audience. So there's something to reading that, yes, I agree, is, is an act of it is feminist activism for me and thank you thank you for that very astute uh kind of look at uh at what you were getting from um from my talk thank you So people might be pretty tired. Yes. Should I uh, jump in? Yuru, thank you so much for the moderation. Um, I just want to add that uh, um, this was, of course, a very intense and very difficult, um, uh, very difficult uh, webinar for some. I mean, uh, uh, the way you narrativize everything. I mean, I think people need to obviously also know the uh, political and historical context to understand it and. It requires some time for uh, your words to sink in. So uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that you read quite slowly for us all to um, try to digest the material. Uh, thank you very much. It was extremely moving and I look for, forward to uh, reading more. Um, and this will be recorded and I'm sure everybody uh, took down um, you know, the title of your work. 
And um, I just want to add that if there's anybody who would like to get in touch with Rela, they can write to us at sujander at sabanjiuniv.edu. Uh, and um, we look forward to, and Rela, you're invited as well, um, to meeting uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, this time we're going to shift back uh, to the U.S. context and uh, our uh, speaker is going to be uh, Jessica Cabrera and her title is The Feminist Playbook for Winning Back Title IX, a focus on Title IX anti-harassment law in U.S. higher education. So I hope, Rela, you can also join us. I um, hope so too. Yeah, in two weeks' time. And so uh, thanks so much for coming to everybody. It must be so difficult to, I mean, we've been uh, webinared out. I mean, uh, that's <laughs> yes. very obvious. And it's the end of June and everybody's quite tired. But still, thank you for um, staying with yeah, us. I, I should add also that it's, it's um it's material that sometimes feels embarrassing to to dive into and to ask about and uh i understand the silence also may be coming from there yeah yeah it's really not so easy to comment on and yeah. uh, work on so but uh, uh much appreciated that you brought it up and uh we need to find a language to talk about it as well um, so thank you so much, Rela, uh, for this. So I'd like to just ask uh, the Sue Gender team and Rela to remain. And uh, thank you so much to all the participants for being with us tonight. And I look forward to seeing all of you in two weeks. Thank you.